So welcome everyone to the first lecture of the 2022 Fishtails Lecture Series, presenting the science of Great Lakes fisheries. We are so pleased that you are joining us either in person here at the Collins Learning Center at Crossroads or via Zoom and Facebook Live. It's just nice to be able to gather people here again uh, compared to last year. Our presentation tonight is protecting the Great Lakes from invasive carp, the Brandon Road Interbasin Barrier Project, presented by Dr. Tammy Newcomb from the F uh, Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Due to travel restrictions by the DN Michigan DNR, uh, Tammy is not able to be here in person and she will present her uh, presentation through Zoom and we're projecting it on the screen here at Crossroads. The Fishtails Lecture Series is an educational program of the Crossroads at Big Creek Learning Center and <clears throat> uh, Nature Preserve. My name is Mark Holy and I'm the Fishtails Program Organizer. I also want to recognize the Door County Library and thank them for their partnership to provide our lectures both last year and this year via Zoom and Facebook Live. This is the first of four lectures. Two of our lectures will address different topics related to invasive carp, which is timely as just this past year, there were two positive detections of invasive carp eDNA in the Milwaukee River and reminds us of the ongoing threat of invasive carp entering the Great Lakes. To learn the capability and limitations of eDNA surveillance in Lake Michigan, be sure to come back on February 24th to see Dr. Carrie Ann Heyer from the US Fish and Wildlife Service discuss environmental DNA as a tool to detect the arrival of invasive carps in the Lake Michigan Basin. At our next presentation on Monday, January 31st, you will learn how scientists pry into the private lives of fishes using acoustic telemetry from Dr. Chuck Kruger, the founder and director emeritus of the basin-wide Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System. And then finally, on March 17th, Dr. Karen Murchie, Director of Freshwater Research at the Shedd Aquarium, will present suckers, swimming superheroes of the Great Lakes, and will speak on the ecology and importance of suckers in the Great Lakes. So be sure to join us on our remaining lectures. A few housekeeping details for those joining via Zoom. Your microphone should be muted during the presentation. Please use the chat feature to ask questions that we will address at the end of the presentation. This lecture includes live transcription. So if you wanna access it, please click the closed caption symbol in the bottom toolbar, then click show subtitle. And finally, this lecture will be recorded and available at the Door County Library Calendar website. I'm very privileged to announce or to introduce Dr. Tammy Newcomb and her presentation on the Brandon Road Interbasin Barrier Project. Dr. Newcomb serves as a senior water policy advisor in the director's office of the Michigan DNR. In her role, she leads the coordination of cross departmental and statewide issues related to the Great Lakes for the department, such as keeping invasive carp out of the lakes. She recently led implementation of a $5 million invasive species program for the state of Michigan and a 1 million innovation challenge grant on invasive carp. Dr. Newcomb received her bachelor's and doctorate degrees in fisheries and wildlife at Michigan State University and she has a master's degree from West Virginia University in forestry. Prior to her current appointment, she served as the manager of the Michigan DNR Fisheries Division Research Program. Before she began work in Michigan, she was an assistant professor at Virginia Polytech Institute State University with a research program focused on the management of regulated rivers. Invasive carps, especially big head and silver carp are plentiful in the lower Illinois River and are slowly making their way toward the Chicago waterway system and its connection to Lake Michigan. Presently, there's a series of three electrical barriers about 37 miles from Lake Michigan, serving as the only obstacle 
should these fish continually move in mass upstream toward the lake. Recently, state and federal resource agencies decided a more effective and permanent barrier was needed. They reached consensus that the Brandon Road Lock and Dam near Joliet, Illinois, 55 miles from the lake, be outfitted with multiple barrier technologies, not just electricity. And with the Army Corps of Engineers as the lead agency for what is now referred to as the Brandon Road Interbasin Project. Dr. Newman serves on the project's leadership team and is uniquely qualified to provide both management and policy perspectives on these efforts to permanently keep invasive carps from entering the Great Lakes. Tammy, it's all yours. All righty, thank you, Mark. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, Mark and I go way back and it was a delight to hear from him asking me to speak to all of you this evening, both those in person and, and online. I apologize I can't be there in person, but I do love the fact that we have this ability to reach so many more people from the comfort of your living room. So hey, uh, make sure you got your popcorn, grab a beverage to drink, and I'm going to tell a little bit of a story tonight. It's going to be kind of a quick story, and there's lots of information here, but um, uh, hopefully you'll find it useful. So my job, as Mark said, is the Senior Water Policy um, Advisor for the Department of Natural Resources in Michigan. But for the better part of 10 years, uh, priority focus for me in my work has been to ensure that um, the Great Lakes are protected from these fish. And early on, the early days, when we didn't have a lot of information and we didn't have a lot of tools, it was a very scary time. And of course, it all started with um, some litigation that was all the way, or it was at the Supreme Court. Um, that got set aside and we continued on together as a region to try and, and um, solve this problem and protect the Great Lakes. So tonight, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, why it's important, why these fish are a risk. We're going to talk about where we're at right now. So right now, um, when we talk about the Great Lakes, that this is a little bit of a Michigan-centric perspective, but the fact is Michigan has four of those five lakes of which our state borders. And so we've got more than 3,000 miles of coastline. We've got 11,000 inland lakes and 36,000 miles of rivers and streams. And when people talk about invasive carp in the Great Lakes, as you all know intricately well, that means our inland rivers are at risk as well as our inland lakes that are connected to those rivers. Michigan, just like Wisconsin and all the other Great Lakes states and the provinces of Ontario and Quebec have recreational fisheries. We have our boating recreationists. We've got our state licensed commercial fisheries. We have our tribal rights to those fisheries that we have to honor and make sure that they have access to those fisheries. And then of course, as I just mentioned, our inland lakes and rivers. So tonight, one of the things that we're going to do is dispel some myths. First of all, I hear this all the time. Well, it doesn't matter if they get to the Great Lakes. We'll just stop more predators to eat them all. Or, hey, we can just fish them out if they get here. Or it's just too expensive and complicated to solve this problem, so we're not going to bother. Or we have a stalled population front. They're not going to get to the Great Lakes because they're not moving. Um, or I hear, well, they're just going to get here anyhow, so why do you spend uh, time at night worrying about it? Um, and then we hear they're already here, which that is, that is another uh, myth we're going to dispel. So tonight we're going to talk about what is the threat, why is urgency needed, what is the Brandon Road Project, what has Michigan been doing, and I can also vouch for many of your Wisconsin uh, folks as well because they're side by side with me at many of these tables that we're at. Um, and then what you can do. So invasive carps, tonight we're gonna talk about big head carp, silver carp, and black carp. Those are the three species that are not in the Great Lakes um, as of yet. Grass carp are also in this category, but as you know, different states have different rules. Michigan has always prohibited grass carp um, since like the 60s, I think it is. Um, but some states have allowed them in the past. So we do have grass carp in, the um, in Lake Erie that we're working on in eradication. But tonight's focus is on these three. And of course, we, this is not about common carp at all. Common carp are a different class. They feed differently. They act differently. They've been here for a long time. They were brought here as food fish in the 1800s. That's not what we're talking about. So invasive carp 
have these qualities that make them invasive. So they have a very high reproductive rate. They spread quickly, they grow quickly, and they have a high potential to cause damage, both damage to the resource as well as damage to people. We have incidences of people getting hit in the jaw, getting knocked out of the boat. Bones have been broken as the silver carp do their flying through the air thing. We know they're suited to the Great Lakes climate. There's a there's a lake in Turkey that freezes every year quite a good bit, and they do just fine in that lake. So we know the cold doesn't bother them a bit. Um, and they will compete with food for food and space with many of our fishes. So space, just because of the size, and they're so big. And we've seen, as in Kentucky and a couple of other places, you've seen where they come into the rivers to spawn, and they just they, they die because there's so many fish in the river at once. Um, but they will compete with food, particularly for our juvenile, with our juvenile fishes, or, or on our, um, and they will even eat our larval fishes as part of their food items. So the idea that we can just stock more predators to eat them all, because they grow so quickly, they grow very quickly beyond a size at which predators can even eat them. And we have to remember too, that if we stock a lot of predators out there, there's not always gonna be carp for those predators to eat, they're gonna eat the other things too. So stocking more predators really isn't an answer for controlling these fish if they were to get into the Great Lakes. Um, secondly, um, the scientists has sorry, scientists have demonstrated over the last several years through different types of modeling projects that these fish have the potential to do a lot of damage in the Great Lakes. Um, they'll spread rapidly, even with very small initial abundances. And one of the risk assessments shows that it only takes about 10 fish to start a population colonizing here in the Great Lakes. We've seen researchers show effects on yellow perch and walleye. We've seen the effects from these models on plankton and planktivorous um, fish in Saginaw Bay. That's been one of the project locations. And then climate change, of course, is predicted to enhance and increase productivity and population growth. Now, the magic eight ball there at the bottom is because we've had to prove all along, well, you know, you just don't know that these fish are gonna be a problem. And if you can't say it with certainty, <clears throat> they probably aren't going to be a problem. Well, no, we can't say that anymore because we have so many examples of invasive species in the Great Lakes and the damage that they have done. We don't need to wait for the invasion to occur to conclude that we need to do something about them now. The other um, thing that I've heard is, well, you can just fish them out. This is a slide of data and the details aren't that important, but these are three different locations in the Illinois River where big head and silver carp are being fished out using commercial methods. And this is a very important method to control the population abundance in the river to help prevent them from building up um, <clears throat> and moving upstream even faster and quicker. And what you can see here though, if we move to the right, these are the years and this, the height of these bars is the number of fish that are harvested each year. Um, in some cases, we see the numbers increasing. In some cases, we see them come down. Um, in, but the point with this is that not that they're increasing or decreasing because there's been differences in their effort of the fishing. The fact is that they're still there in great abundance. So these are just the fish they catch. There's still more left in the river. So this is just a proportion of what's out there. And so the idea that we can just fish them out <clears throat> It's a very inefficient method to controlling invasive species or thinking about eradicating them. I'm not being critical of the fact that we're doing it because right now that's one of the only tools that we have, but it's just not going to be something that's going to be very feasible for the Great Lakes when we're looking at a single river. So why is the urgency needed? Well, here is the distribution map of big head silver and black carp in, in the US right now. When I first started working on this project, none of these green dots were here, none of them. Uh, none of these green dots were here. These red ones up here were not right here. None of these were present on this graph and most of these were not present on this graph. So <clears throat> these fish have been able to go in and exploit every place that they've been able to get access to. We have nothing to believe that they would respond any differently in the Great Lakes. And they have moved very quickly throughout all of these locations. You'll see there's two dots here in Lake Erie. Those were fish that were captured 
there's about three to five fish that were captured uh, early on in the 2000s. They were shown to be from, um, I believe it was the aquaculture <clears throat> industry, but they, the, the thinking there is that they were some sort of release. They didn't get there just by accident. They actually were released um, into the lake as part of um, uh, a cultural um, act from where fish are released in a ceremony. And at that time, these fish were available in the live trade market. They are no longer available in the live trade market and haven't been since. So we have not found any evidence of any other live um, big head carp in Lake Erie or any other uh, portion of the Great Lakes. <clears throat> and I mean live fish. We'll talk about eDNA later. Well, here is just a little bit of a primer on the Chicago River, <clears throat> Chicago area waterway, excuse me. There are five locations where invasive carp could enter into the Great Lakes. The biggest concerns though are here at the Chicago River and then of course on the Calumet River. Um, I just wanna orient you a little bit to this orange dot right here. These are the electric barriers that are about 37 miles from Lake Michigan. And then this is Lockport Dam. Lockport Dam is a dam that actually controls the water levels for the, the river towards the lake. And then there's Brandon Road Lock and Dam, which we'll talk about even more as part of this project. So here's the reason why we're concerned. There have been two fish found over near uh, the Calumet River and Calumet Lake over there. There has been um, big head carp that was during the rote known that was captured in 2009. So there's been a few, not a lot. And there's a lot of intensive surveillance that goes on out there, but this still concerns us. We know right now that um, this is the Brandon Road Lock and Dam right here. There is a little offshoot here of um, kind of a backwater area where they see and regularly capture fish. And we do have, records of fish going up to the Brandon Road Lock and Dam. So we're concerned. Right now we don't have any evidence to suggest that there's a lot of fish above there, but we are concerned that we're kind of on borrowed time. So the electric barrier system that we talked about is good, but it does have weaknesses. Um, and I'm really sorry, I don't know why these blue lines are occurring on the screen. Um, that's not my computer. So um, <clears throat> the electric barrier system has weaknesses. The fish it can get in between what's called the rake and box junction between these barges, and they can go through the electric barrier um, without getting stunned. And they, we know that they can travel a long ways in that, in that juncture. <clears throat> we also know that small fish can pass through the electric barrier because sometimes the electricity isn't even top to bottom. Um, and that um, uh, it's harder to shock smaller fish than it is bigger fish. Now, at this time, we don't have any evidence of any small big head, silver or black carp up near the barrier. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then the third feature here is that um, as the barges move through the water, they can be pushed, or as the barges move through, they can push and pull water through with them, which also can bring the, the small fish through. So we know that that electric barrier in that location at Joliet is not foolproof. So um, let's talk about the Brandon Road project then. So we've, we've established that the threat is there. We established that we, they, there is a sense of urgency. <clears throat> we've identified a potential location. In Glimmerus in 2014, there were several alternatives looked at and Brandon Road was part of that um, package. Um, this was a report that went to Congress at the time um, and it kind of sat on the shelf for a little while before we were able to agree to and, and work on um, the chosen location at Brandon Road. There was another part of that report that also identified 18 other pathways. But with those pathways, um, there were only four locations that were, were shown to have vulnerability for the Great Lakes. Um, one of those was Eagle Marsh, and that was closed up very quickly in Indiana. Ohio right now is working on the Ohio Erie Canal and Little Killabuck Creek. Um, <clears throat> they're doing a yeoman's job of 
of trying to get those connections severed. They're literally places in the middle of cornfields where the two watersheds can connect. And then Parker Cobb Ditch was dealt with very early on in Indiana. It was literally just a ditch that they went in and, and um, put a barrier in. So let's go back here just to reorient with the Chicago Area Waterway. Um, so this is where Brandon Road Lock and Dam is. There is, at this lock and dam, um, there is the, the lock itself, which is very narrow for the barges to go through. And then there's a large uh, dam. The only way the fish can get through at this location is through that lock. And even at high flows, they cannot get up over the dam. So this makes it a perfect location for us to consider for a barrier system. In 2018, the Great Lakes Coalition did a survey people throughout the basin because we were struggling to kind of get momentum going. More than 90% of all of the respondents from each state in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin view increasing protections to block Asian carp from entering the Great Lakes as important and they wanted it done immediately. And that was in 2018. So <clears throat> the good part was Congress authorized the Brandon Road Lock and Dam Project to design a series of um, deterrence to prevent fish from moving through the, that lock and dam there. So here's what came out in terms of the recommended plan. Um, we've got, um, there's some boat launches for additional safety and access, but we've got the flushing lock right here. This is where the boats go through right now. And the purpose for that flushing lock is to flush out the floating life stages, things that would be like eggs that might come up with the barges in that push-pull kind of uh, water dynamic that we talked about. So there's a flushing lock there to flush all of those sort of things out. This channel here, they're calling it an engineered channel because it will have walls and a bottom. And what that will do will prevent the electricity from straying, which is what it does at Joliet, and help them have a more refined approach to both electricity and then the other deterrents that are there as well, which includes a um, acoustic deterrent, which is sound. So they figured out a, a sound wave level that will deter these fish. And then there is also a um, bubbler type of system that will dislodge fish that would be in between those barges, like I talked about earlier. So this is a, a gauntlet. You've seen it referred to in the news as a gauntlet. And the idea is that, that the probability of a fish passing through each one of these, let alone all of them, becomes steadily less and less as they go into this, this lock chamber. Um, this is just kind of talking again about the modes of transport. So we've got the swimmers, the floaters, and the hitchhikers, and a little bit more about the sound is on the bottom. Um, the engineered channel is with these walls, um, air bubbles um, to dislodge, and then there is an electric barrier planned in this um, system as well. <clears throat> so the current status right now is that in 2020, um, the Water Resources Development Act authorized the Brandon Road pro project for construction at a cost of 858 million. And that came with an 80% federal cost and a 20% non-federal cost. So this was a great thing because they said, okay, um, here is the authority to go ahead and construct it. You still have to have the appropriation, but at least now the authority is there for the Army Corps of Engineers to construct it. It allowed for the consideration of additional technologies, which is a little bit different. A lot of times when these things go forward, they're stuck in one place, but this is allowing for the most recent technologies, the best technologies to be used. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the timelines. So we won't focus on that right now. So we know it's not too complicated. And we don't believe that, that it's too costly to protect the Great Lakes using this project. So this is just a little bit of our um, partnering pathway. I mean, this all of this started in 2014. 2007 to 2014 was the big time gap between the original Glimmerous project and the resulting um, um, uh, initial report. 2015 to 2018, we came out, uh, the Corps came out with a feasibility study, and then we took some time 
to be able to get the chiefs out, and that's the report to Congress. 2019, that report went to Congress and said, this is what we need to do. We had a meeting together, um, all the states and the provinces met together in 2019 in Chicago. And then um, Michigan agreed to put forward 10, uh, part of the $10 million that was required for the non-federal sponsor. So we had to come up with 35% of the overall cost of the project, the design part of the project. We were all launched to do that in early 2020. And then of course COVID hit and everybody kind of stopped the roll of their budgets at that point in time. So it took us a little bit longer to get things going. So Michigan and Illinois right now are working through an intergovernmental agreement with the Army Corps of Engineers on the design for Brandon Road. We also have a, a states and provinces forum that I'll talk more about. So Illinois came up with two and a half million Michigan put 8 million on the table and we started rolling with the core then on getting these designs done. And I, Michigan is part, we're at the table with all of the conversations with the core on designing those individual elements right now. What's called the Brandon Road Interbasin Project, which was in the title, there is a website that you can go to. And if you just Google Brandon Road Interbasin Project, you'll get there. Um, on that website, you can see we've got two newsletters that are out that are talking about the development of the project right now. There are quarterly webinars that you can join in on. There are, um, there's a way for you to put your email in and you can get notified when there's a new newsletter or when there's a, a webinar coming up. And this is what the timeline's looking like right now. Um, so we started fiscal year 22 here. We're com they're gathering data. We've done um, five what's called charrettes. What we're trying to do is get the best design for the least amount of money because we want to try and reduce that overall cost. Um, we're going to take a couple of years for plans and specifications and then in 2024 they should be able to begin constructing the project. Um, I just wanted to point out that one of the strengths behind all of this is all of the governors and premiers getting behind this. So there's the Conference of Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers, which adopted a resolution, a very forward-leaning resolution saying we needed to do something about invasive carp, and this happened in 2019. Um, then, um, of course, we talked about it in 2020, the House um, authorized um, the project to, to fund um, well, Congress and all authorized the project um, for construction. And then um, we've been gathering as a states and provinces from all of the eight states and Ontario and Quebec to get updates from the core, get specific updates, um, talk about um, any issues that are arising with the design. And what we're really trying to do is bring everybody to the table who, had, who needs to support this project to an understanding and agreement that what's being designed and what will be implemented will be um, effective enough to protect the Great Lakes. Um, just recently, as recently as December 10th, um, 2021, all of the uh, eight state governors signed a letter to Congress asking for full federal funding. We believe that this project, because remember of that $858 million price tag right now, the states will have to come up with 20% of that. It's a pretty big lift for the states to come up with. But the states believe that this is in the national interest to conduct this project and do this project. And so they have asked for 100% federal funding um, from uh, the congressional members to include in the next WERDA, and WERDA is the Water Resources Development Act, or Water Resources Reform and Development Act, which is the act that tells the Army Corps of Engineers what to do, what projects to do, and how to do it. And so we've asked for full federal funding to be included in that bill. Um, I just want to point out here that it's all of the states recognize the Great Lakes as the economic engine that they, as the, of, that they are. The $6 trillion regional economy, the $7 billion commercial and sport fishing industry, the $15 billion recreational boating industry, all of these things would be threatened if carp were to come into the Great Lakes. Um, the letter also recognizes the effects on the local and regional economies that rely on tourism as well as property values. And then finally recognizing that the environmental impacts would be lasting um, if these fish were to get into the Great Lakes. 
So this is just a real quick overview of Michigan's commitment. I mean, we are here at the table to solve problems. We're not here to place blame. We're here to solve problems. We want everybody at the table as, alongside us as well, all of the states and their technical expertise alongside us. Um, we are committed to being science-driven in both our monitoring and response, which is what we're going to talk about next. This is just a laundry list of all the different things that we engage in as a state agency. And like I said earlier, Wisconsin DNR is often right by my side at many of these tables too, um, wanting to protect Lake Michigan from these fish. I want to talk a little bit about surveillance and effort right now. People say, well, the fish, they're already here. They're already here, for goodness sake. Why are we spending all this money to do this? And Mark mentioned earlier at the start about the two passive eDNA um, findings in the Milwaukee River. And your uh, one of your fish biologists was on the phone with me right away with that finding and talking about it because we had a similar situation in the Kalamazoo River a few years back. Um, and so you start looking at the circumstances, you do testing, more testing with the environmental DNA um, to try and evaluate, is this real or is this um, an artifact of either being brought there biologically or uh, on contaminated on some, uh, from some boats? Because we know especially that those bunkers that are with boats that are covered with carpeting, that really can carry the eDNA around. And in the Michigan case, we had a parking lot that had several uh, Illinois boats from bow fishers in it. So that was what we kind of attributed our finding to. But the importance is that we're doing repeated surveillance. We're developing the baseline right now. We've got a lot of zeros out there, but we've also got an intensive commercial fisher. We've fishery, we've got anglers out there who are seeing things and reporting things. Um, there are independent monitoring and research assessments that are going on, not specifically for invasive carp, but other species, and, but there's a lot of gear in the water out there. And then we do the eDNA surveillance um, with the Fish and Wildlife Services um, help. They lead that, we help get access and help decide where those samples occur. And that also occurs, of course, in Wisconsin waters. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot more about that eDNA because you've got a speaker coming up who's going to really tell you all about that, but that's a really important part of our tool for, for um, getting an early indication of whether or not they're here. But to date, there is no evidence to suggest that there are any live silver, bighead, or black carp present in the Great Lakes. So we're not going to say that they're already here. I'm not going to talk about the eDNA. Um, we'll get here anyhow. So this is the other thing. I, why are you doing this? Because they're just going to get here anyhow. Well, let me tell you, folks, I sleep, dream, eat, think about carp. That's that's my number one job is to make sure that these fish don't get into the Great Lakes. And I don't understand the defeatist attitude a lot of the times with that because we have something that is worth protecting. And so it's worthwhile to make the effort to do that. And we do that many ways with law enforcement. Uh, many of the states have law enforcement that are surveilling the bait. Um, both wholesale and retail surveillance. They're increasing awareness out there with those folks. We've got the campaigns for the clean, drain, dry um, with the boats to try and increase awareness, not only for invasive carp, but other invasive species as well. Uh, Wisconsin has, um, I looked online today, if you were to find something, they want pictures, they want you to call the local office. So people want you to be aware. Um, <clears throat> Illinois DNR and Fish and Wildlife Service are doing uh, huge amounts of effort right now to contain these fish and keep them from approaching any closer to the Great Lakes. And that we could talk about that for days. Um, but that's all online at asiancarp.us, or I'm sorry, invasivecarp.us. Um, so you can see all of the work that's going on there. And then Ohio and Indiana are closing off the other pathways. So there's lots of things that are being done right now, rather than just sort of sitting back and watching them come in. But every day that these are not present in the Great Lakes, it gives us more time to do the research and develop the technology for meaningful detection, eradication, and other types of control options. And all of you are part of helping us keep these fish at bay. So what can you do? We just want you to be observant. All of the agencies know that many of you get out and on the water far more than we as individuals do. And so we need you to be observant. We need you to know your bait. 
we've identified that that um, these small fishes can look the small carps can look like other bait fish so you, you need to be observant of what's in your bait don't dump your bait put your bait maybe in your garden or or in the garbage can when you're done but don't dump it back in the water again report to local fisheries offices um, with pictures if you can <clears throat> and if you get something don't put it back in the water um, support efforts towards Brandon Road. Uh, we still need a lot of support in order to get through the final construction phase on this project. Um, practice prevention for all invasive species because that clean drain dry can help you keep or keep from transferring even eggs from one place to another. And then share your knowledge with other people. If you hear something interesting that I've brought to you tonight, please share it with other people. Um, there's several resources that you can find online, the Brandon Road Project. Um, you can look up the Inner Basin Project, just Google it. Invasivecarp.us is an active site. Um, we've got, um, in Michigan, there's an online reporting site, and then all of the states have invasive species websites. So oh, that uh, brings me now to any questions that you may have. Okay, there we go. We have a question right here. I was wondering if there's any commercial value to these types of carp as fish food or fertilizer or anything like that that somebody might want to harvest these things. There's a question about what is the commercial value of, of these carp? So Illinois right now, I just found the annotate tool to erase all of those blue lines that were throwing me off there. Um, Illinois right now is working on some of that. I don't know the answers for the specific values, but part of the issue um, is that there's not a lot of um, commercial value right now. There's not a lot of different types of markets for these fish, so they're working to um, create some of that. But we've found time and time again that um, it's very difficult to think about marketing your way out of an invasive species problem. It's just the the enormousness of it is is large, and the other issue is that you have to have such a high mortality rate in places where it's difficult to fish that the economics can very quickly go towards an unattainable solution because it just simply costs too much to go in and get the fish when they're in low abundance in these places that are hard to get them. But how many pounds are being removed by those contract fishermen in Illinois? Is it like a million pounds a year or something like that? Yeah, and, and a, I think it's over a million pounds a year. But those reports are all online um, on invasivecart.us. You can find all of that information there. <clears throat> Chris. Um, for people's information, I know that the carp is in harvested and chopped up, put in frozen blocks, and shipped to Maine for the Maine fishermen to use in their lobster traps, which is also causing problems down with the right whales because of the lobster traps and climate change. So uh, <laughs> they have been harvesting them and trying to use them as bait fish um, in chopped up form in other air, other fisheries in the country. So for those that may not have heard that on Zoom, uh, there's a comment that um, some of the carp have been chopped up and used for lobster bait up in Maine. Yeah. Any other questions? How about on, okay, here we are. Um, the, I mean, there's 10 states and provinces that have to pay for the, Brandon uh, project, are they going to pay equally or Michigan and Illinois planning to pay a big chunk of it? The question is uh, in paying the, the bill for the Brandon Roadlock project, uh, it, will it be all the Great Lakes states um, paying together and how much might that payment be yeah. distributed and that kind of thing? Uh, I'm sure That's a yeah, and that's a really good question. <clears throat> Again, right 
now the governors have asked for consideration for 100% federal funding so that we wouldn't have to do the, the non-federal cost share on the $800 million price tag. Um, in the past, there's been, uh, like for the SULOX and some other projects in the past, we have talked about splitting costs by jurisdictional area. So in that case, Michigan's got like 51% of the jurisdictional area. So obviously our part of the price tag would be uh, a bit more than others, quite a bit more than others. But uh, those conversations haven't been had yet um, because I think we're, we're still trying to get consideration for that 100% federal funding. Michigan had set aside the 8 million um, fortuitously. In the last administration, there was a bit of, of money that was available at the end of the year. And so um, there were this money was set aside into a construction fund for the purposes of just to demonstrate Michigan commitment about moving forward with this project. So, um, you know, we're always appreciative when any administration um, recognizes the, um, the importance of the Great Lakes this way. Um, I know why I was thrown off because I had an additional slide. I must've pulled up the wrong presentation. The news this week was of the, um, the infrastructure bill and the Army Corps having over 200 and I think it's over $230 um, million to start with the construction part of the project. So that was huge. In this current administration federally did listen to the governors uh, in terms of their request for making Brandon Road happen. So a large portion of the of the cost, about a third of the cost potentially um, will be coming out of, of the current infrastructure bill. So that was a big deal that happened this week, but we still have that 80% um, federal, 20% non-federal cost share to deal with on the overall price tag. And before we begin construction, we have to figure that out. So is there any chance that Canada can, could contribute to this project? Um, Yes. Um. <laughs> but not likely, right? <laughs> well, I mean, there was a question that came up that way. So that's why I'm, one reason why I'm yeah. asking. You know, it's, it's interesting in that um, it's tough for the Canadian partners to pitch in. I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility, and they surely are supporting this. But I, I, don't, I don't know that it's extremely likely. Now, I will say that Canada and Ontario and Quebec are all doing surveillance programs and they're right, they're at the table in their concerns from the ecological, biological perspectives, and they've been good partners on response um, actions and things like that. So they are as concerned and they would like to see things done. So who is, who is researching all these different types of uh, uh, technologies to be implemented at the Brandon Road Lock? Yeah. So right now, um, there are different federal agencies right now that are investigating all the different technologies. So the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, US Geological Survey, their laboratory, our laboratories are doing some of this work. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service is doing some experimental work with a a system on Barkley Lake in Kentucky to try and evaluate some of the different layering of technologies there as well. Um, we've had some university um, work done and then the, the, um, the contest, the challenge, the Great Lakes Invasive Carp Challenge that you mentioned earlier, Mark, where we had the million dollars out there really had some interesting findings or some interesting approaches um, the winner of that was suggested using a uh, cavitation. When a ball bear cavitations when a propeller whirls in the water really fast and it creates bubbles that actually have a sensation to them. I mean, it's essentially boiling water 
um, because the energy is so high from that. So it's not just compressed air moving through the water, but it's cavitation. It's just several of those items, there hasn't been the ability to get the research and development invested in them in time to make them feasible for this project. I think there's, there is promise out there for the future. How much of the Erdic lab of the core is being devoted to the Asian or invasive carbon? Yes, great question. So Erdic is the, I can't tell you, it's ERDC and it's down in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And it's a huge lab that does research for combat in addition to work on um, aquatic issues like invasive species. And right now that lab is creating models. So scaled down models of the Brandon Road Lock and Dam project to be able to evaluate um, efficacy for these different technologies. So there's a large, a large investment right now just trying to understand the dynamics. Because one of the things that's concerning, especially to the maritime industry, is they don't want to set up like with this flushing lock because so many of much of what is being done here has never been done before in the US. They want to make sure that they aren't setting up for unintended consequences um, and posing hazards to the maritime industry um, in the future. So they develop these scaled down models to help them size up to um, making the full scale plans for the water waterway. Yeah, I've actually visited the Erdic lab uh, a couple of times and it is amazing what they can do there. Um, and there's a lot invested there. Plus, we also know that um, at the Great Lakes Science Center for USGS that they're doing a lot of uh, research as well to work on this. What happened to it? You still there, Tammy? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Did I disappear? There you go. Yep. Uh, this to me sounds like a bureaucratic nightmare. Uh, is there? a controlling function or one person or to oversee the entire bureaucratic nightmare? <laughs> did, you, did you hear that? But who's, who's up on top? What's the person of that, or what's that person's name who just asked that question? John. John. John, dear John. Sometimes I feel like I'm that lone voice in the wilderness. Um, it It is, uh, at times, it is a bureaucratic nightmare. I will say that. At times, when we have not been all pulling in the same direction, it's been very, very difficult. Um, anytime we get a change in leadership in any state or any congressional seat or the Army Corps of Engineers commanders change every three, three years, you know, it's always a hold your breath and wait and see, okay, how is this going to change the dynamic? Um, but I had a very, very good mentor who always just said, you know what, progress is in incremental and you just keep your eye on the prize at the end of the day. And so many of us in this fight get up every day, we run against the wall, we fall down, and then we get up the next day and we do the same thing because, you know, what stands to be lost is too great. We can never go back once these fish get into the Great Lakes. We can never go back. So yes, it's bureaucratically very difficult, but we have to learn how to first and foremost do the protection right now. And like I said, Illinois has got a ton of different measures that they're taking. The federal agencies have a ton of different measures. And even though I'm critical and I criticize that electric barrier that's there. I'm very grateful that it's there because it's better than not having anything there right now. So um, we continue to work the system um, and there's just been some enormous gains over the last 24 months in spite of COVID. Um, Army Corps is working their tails off. I honestly, I, I'm very complimentary of the dedication of those folks because um, they were working all the way through Christmas. They were getting things put out and on the table and we've got to get decisions made. So they're doing a great job. So it does take a bit of patience to say, okay, well, here's where we are right now. Like the biggest issue that's keeping me up at night right now is how we're going to get that 20% non-federal cost share if we can't get this fully funded. So we just, we have to keep working and keep 
pressing and how important it is. And that's where I say all of you have a part in this too, to make sure that your elected officials know that you want to see this happen, that you want to see the Great Lakes protected. But th thank you for recognizing that enormous workload. Um, but there are ways to, we have a bureaucratic process, but we also have successful ways to work through that process and time and persistence will usually win out. Thank you for her efforts. I nominate her as the czar of the silver carpet. Did you hear that, Tammy? He wants you to be the czar of silver carpet. <laughs> well, I, I know in just the years that I was working uh, on the Great Lakes, you know, the, the Corps of Engineers has certain authorities because of these waterways and all that kind of stuff. So they are the, the appropriate organization to do the they have the engineering background and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. From an operating standpoint, it's always seemed like whenever you engage the core, they go slower and cost a lot. But then again, they have the full package. They, and they, the authorities they have from Congress are much broader than like the Department of Interior mm -hmm. uh, and so on. Um, so they have the right uh, uh, setup to do it. Uh, you know, and the way the Great Lakes are working, you know, the communication between the states even the province or the, you know, Canada and the core to make sure that it's relevant to the states as well, seems to be going fairly well. Uh, if you look at the, you know, one of the pages you can get to on one of those websites she had, it has the committee structure of the Brandon Road project. And there's about five layers, but it, it names people that are involved. Their governors are at one level, you know, DNR directors at another, and, and Tammy's in there at a couple of levels as well. So, at least the you know the, the on the ground folks and states are integrally involved with this, so you have to be somewhat confident. You know, in terms of putting together a big project like, like this, they've gotten to the point where it's functioning well. Um, it's just a matter of paying for it. And well, it is, yeah, and and the Army Corps does what Congress tells them to do. They don't do what the states tell them to do. They do what Congress tells them to do. So that's. That's part of the circle of, of making sure that things continue to move forward. And I did want to mention two folks too, um, Brad Eggold with Wisconsin DNR and Steve Galarno with Wisconsin DNR are both um, frequent participants. And um, I have Steve, Steve's on my, my uh, rapid dial, you know, and, and I'm on his too. So there's good, good liaisoning back and forth with wish Michigan and Wisconsin too. Most of you know, may know Brad Eggold, he's in the fisheries uh, part of this um, DNR, but uh, Steve Galerno is in the office of the Great Lakes uh, for uh, Wisconsin. And I think he's stationed in Plymouth. And you don't, a lot of hunters and fishermen don't always often hear from the office of the Great Lakes, but they deal with the policy level stuff much like Tammy's doing for the state of Michigan. Yep. Any so, other questions? I guess I'm curious, is there any questions from folks online? Well, I asked the one about the Canada pan, but I haven't seen any other chats. Is there anybody okay. that wants to ask a question? Actually, at this point, you could probably unmute yourself and ask the question directly if you'd like. Um, I don't see any coming forth. Oh, Chris has another one. Great Lakes and St. Lawrence initiatives, cities initiatives, are they participating in any of this? Do we have, I know we have a Wisconsin representative with that initiative. Are they doing anything? The question, do you hear that question, Tammy? Was it about the It's about the uh, cities what, what's the involvement of the Great Lakes uh, cities or mayors? Yeah. That's the group. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They are really good. Um, I talk with Matt Doss quite a bit. Um, they are engaged, they are supportive, and they put their weight behind this when they can. Yeah. <clears throat> I have another question. Sounds like a lot of different organizations are very much involved. Is it up at our Congress and Senator level? I mean, do we have people in Congress? Uh, that represent um, the different states and the senators 
is it at that level as well or yeah i, I think the if i could paraphrase a little bit you know what's the great lakes congressional involvement with this and, and how much support is there mm -hmm. there's enormous support from very key players um i don't i can start naming them all off but we've got there's the great lakes task force um for both the House and the Senate, and those members are very engaged with this issue, um, very forward leaning on this. The, the only um, criticism that I've heard from a congressional member from someone in the Great Lakes is that it's, it's expensive. And I don't disagree that it is expensive, but, um, but the costs of what it would be if they were to get into the Great Lakes would be super expensive and forever as well. So that's been the only criticism. Otherwise, the congressional members have all been very forward leaning, the ones that are engaged on Great Lakes issues. Yeah, well, and that's that's one way that this group can stay involved is write your yes. congressmen and yes. senators and, and let them know because if they do respond or they do sense, you know, people's um, priorities by what they hear. Yes. Hey, Tammy, quick question. I, I jumped on a little bit later on the presentation, maybe you covered it. Is the, the fish barrier really ineffective as far as stopping the carp? Um, Russ, are you referring to the electric barrier that's currently in place? Correct, yes. It's not ineffective. It's just got some weaknesses that are concerning. And those weaknesses come with, you know, the, the smaller fish are more of a challenge. The, um, there's still the push pull with the, the barges moving through with the water, you know, they push, they can push fish in, they can pull fish in and, and through the barrier. And then in between the barges, sometimes fish can get caught. Now, um, so that's that's just concerning because as or if fish were found in more abundance closer to uh, those locations, they could potentially get through. We don't have any signs right now that suggest that we're in danger of that happening each and every day, but it is a concern. Um, and so by shifting that all of that effort down at Brandon Road, you're taking it to a much smaller area and we'll be able to make it more effective than what's up at Joliet. So it's not ineffective, it's just got, it's got some things that are just, that are troubling. <clears throat> well, I will read with interest the Brandon Road project because I was not aware of that, so thank you. And Tammy, I think when you mentioned the, that it'll be an engineered lock all the way around uh, with the bottom and the sides and all that stuff, that will all be designed to get the most out of the electricity in the, in the canal rather than where it's at right now. It just sort of lays on the bottom. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, where it's at right now is the, the channel is just fractured bedrock. So, <clears throat> so when, you know, electricity follows water through the path of least resistance. And so there's a lot of leakage of the electricity out through like those fractures and they have issues with interference. Well, they, they used to have issues with interference like with the local train track signals, the gates and stuff, that was a pretty big deal. And then, uh, so yeah, so, so when you have that kind of leaky system, if you will, it costs more to operate it and then it's not as effective as it, as it could be if it's in that more of a contained and engineered design. So the idea with the engineer channel is that bottom, there'll be an actual bottom to that channel that's made out of either a special concrete or have a layer over it that will protect the electricity from seeping out and going places that it shouldn't, which will reduce the amount of energy required, allow them to be more precise with where the electric is um, effective and it should be safer for the mariners as well. We would completely block off the exits of the Illinois River into Lake Michigan and a small amount of product that comes would be hauled by a train or a truck. Would that be less expensive than the Brandon Road project and be more effective? So I don't know if you heard all that, uh, Tammy, but 
the question basically is, um, and I, I think Glimmerus was uh, um, established to answer the question whether it's better just to block off the rivers and transport the, uh, transport the goods by rail or truck uh, and the cost of getting that all in place versus doing this barrier and so on. Um, can you speak to that whole argument, which I'm sure you've had to answer in the past? Well, that is a that is a very big issue that's still out there. So <clears throat> Brandon Road itself did say the cheapest and most effective way to address this issue is to close the lock. So that's the cheapest and most effective from the resources side of things, but the um, the grand compromise was to develop the system to still allow for navigation. So there's both commercial and recreational navigation there. Um, there's been, I mean, even the Michigan Attorney General uh, weighed in on comments that essentially they had paid for an analysis looking at all of this to say um, it should just close the lock. Um, Michigan Attorney General is elected differently from the governor in Michigan. And so it, it was a little bit of a difference in the state in terms of how we approached this. But um, yes, it is true that it would be most effective and cheaper to close the lock, but the economic consequences around it were not something that people felt was um, <clears throat> a worthy compromise. And I think, as I recall, the statistics when I was working is that you don't realize it, but that Calumet lock, I think that's on the south side of the waterways is one of the busiest commercial locks in the country. And then I think up near the Chicago River, the locks that allow the boats to go in and out, the sailboats, is one of the busiest recreational locks in the country. So it's not like it's just a few boats here and there. It is a significant amount of traffic that occurs in that waterway. Um, so I know, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, I agree with you, let's just cut it off. I mean, that's, that's the best way. But when you, right. I think, you know, there were a lot of conversations. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There were a lot of conversations about the broader infrastructure issues with transportation around Chicago, because rail also has sort of like a log jam there in the Chicago area is my understanding. And then of course, more trucks on the roads was not something that people wanted to do. Most of the commerce come, does, does not go all the way through the waterway. Most of the commerce comes in and comes up, but it doesn't go all the way through. So that that option was evaluated heavily early on, um, but there was just not the support um, to take that pathway for a solution. And so, you know, when we look at the project that's going in, again, it's all about reducing the likelihood of transfer and movement of these fish. And from a, from a biological perspective, from a, a technical perspective, when it comes to fish, this is really a pretty good system. And um, if we can keep everybody at the table um, and still meet the needs of all parties, I mean, part of the issue is it's gonna slow down the barges, the mariners a little bit. Um, and they're not happy with that, but it's part of the compromise in, in keeping the waterway going through. So. We're still looking at ways to make it safe and effective and efficient for the barge operators at the same time making it effective at protecting the Great Lakes. Any other questions? Yeah, it... Okay. Does the temperature of the Great Lakes be lower, uh, quite low? Is fish from migrating into it at any time? That uh, the quite there's another question here, Tammy, about the temperature of the Great Lakes, you know, being rather cool compared to the tributary streams and so on. How does that impact the ability of the carp to, you know, will they want to move into cold water? Can they survive in cold water? You know, all that kind of issue. There's no temperature limitations for carp in the Great Lakes. The only thing that you know, it, Lake Superior is probably the exception in terms of it might slow down their growth, but they would be able to survive and do just fine in the in even in Lake Superior. 
I, I think that normally you associate where the invasive carp are coming from is on somewhere warm in Asia and all that, but I think that its original range includes some northern latitude okay. areas that they've survived in this kind of uh, uh, temperature regime, even yep. in their native range. Yeah. Any questions from the chat? I don't see any there. Any more from the audience? Well, let's give Tammy another round of applause. And, and uh, actually, this is a great turnout given uh, our situation up here with the uh, COVID and all that stuff. So we thank you very much for coming and all those on the, the, the uh, Zoom or Facebook Live, we appreciate your attendance. Tammy, we can't thank you enough for the time that you've taken out and given us such great information. Remember to talk to your congressman about this. Uh, January 31st, learn all you uh, will ever want to know about the acoustic technology that's being applied in the Great Lakes. Um, you'll find uh, Chuck Kruger to be a very good uh, speaker and very knowledgeable about this. He's the one that started the whole GLaDOS uh, uh, project with funding through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And uh, so I look forward to seeing you on Monday, January 31st, same time, same place. And he will be here uh, talking. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah.